Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's the Sunday Assembly welcome. So we're so excited that you're here. Today we have Unnamed Assembly Band version 2.0, or as we like to say it, Girl Power. So now, you know, you can stand if you like. You can sit if you like. But most especially, we love it if you want to dance. So sing along.
this morning. Our, one of our founders and past president of our board is David Lyle, who's going to be hosting for us this morning. So please welcome David. Thank you. Thank you to this awesome band. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. If we could squeeze in and come in, because we've got uh, some folks who have just come in the door here, and yeah, if we could come in. Maybe fill in all the way to the end of the row. That'd be awesome. So welcome to Sunday Assembly. Sunday Assembly is a secular congregation that celebrates life. Yeah. All right. And <laughs> our mission is to help every person find their full potential. Our vision is a Sunday Assembly in every village, town, and city that wants one. We're radically inclusive. Our motto is live better, help often, and wonder more. So we're here at Scarab Bennett to, to, at our monthly service for that bit, to wonder more together. And we've got an awesome speaker today, Dr. Tom Weiler, uh, uh, professor of physics and astronomy over at Vanderbilt, who is going to amaze us all with his information on cosmic rays, and he's like the world's... Uh, uh, the world expert on cosmic wa waves, and, and it's, he was going to blow our mind a little later with wondering, wonderful information on that subject. And the connection between cosmic waves and the physical universe and time itself. So a little housekeeping. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for hanging with us. Uh, newcomers, this is the first time uh, for everyone in the room, because none of us have ever had a Sunday assembly in this room before. <laughs> and so please stick with us, stick with the band, stick with uh, the, uh, Jason, who's 
and Jeremy who are trying to make the screen work. Usually we're uh, just across the way in a really awesome uh, auditorium in Fondren Hall, and it has a great drop-down screen right over the band. But today we're, we're uh, the air conditioning is totally dead there, so we thought maybe we'd be, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe to, we would be happier celebrating this one life we know we have if we were <laughs> cool while we were. <laughs> They had a little AC going. <laughs> no suffering, that's right. So, and a little housekeeping, especially for all of us. So, uh, restrooms are in this building, they're on this floor. You go out this door and make a sharp right, and then look for an, a sign marked exit, a lighted sign with the exit, and go, it's down a little corridor down there. And there's, we have free child care. That child care is directly above us in room B. And uh, so all the little tykes are up there, and they're engaged in story time uh, in a craft project, also contemplating time. So uh, my two six-year-olds are up there uh, you know, thinking about trying to remember the order of the months, I guess. <laughs> Speaking of months, September. It's already September 11, September 11, 2016. So it has been 15 years, can you believe it, since the 9-11 attacks. Wow, there's nothing like uh, a recollection of a traumatic event to put time in perspective. Uh, and the subjective nature of our experience of, of time into perspective. I, you know, it's, uh, when I think about, you know, it, for me and for most of us, those of us in this room who are adults on September 11, it's current events. It's certainly what shapes and informs current events, what's happening you know, last month and what's happening right now in Afghanistan, in Iraq and Syria, and shaping the lives of so many millions of people around the world and affecting us and our mindset and where we are. And yet when I think about those 15 years, I think, gosh, you know, I was born in 1961, and that was barely 15 years, just, just 16 years after the end of World War II. An even more calamitous uh, world event, and t to me as a child, that that war was ancient history. It was distant past, and I, I thought that I was part of a, a new future that was moving on beyond it. And and yet, as an adult, I've come to appreciate how much that past is still with me, still with my family. Still, with um, still affecting the world that is shaping the girls, uh, the world my two little girls will grow up in. So, but it also ref it, it occurs to me that as subjective as our sense of time is, you know, yeah, it, trauma really it, it really impresses our brain, doesn't it? it? Those events we really remember, but there are also the good things, awesome things that we remember. So when um, there, I remember just as vividly the day, for instance, I got this really awesome yellow Tonka truck. It was like <laughs> this big. I swear, I swear it was this big. It was all metal. It was bright yellow. It was awesome. I was, I was, it was 1968. I was seven years old, and it was amazing. And you know what? Uh, because of a series of unhappy circumstances, I came across that truck recently. This year has been sort of an ennis horribilis for me, even as an adult, to, because you're looking at a 55-year-old orphan. Uh, this year, in April, my dad died, uh, April 10. And then my mother had already been very ill. And uh, my amazing siblings and I had been working to take care of her, and even as she continued to take care of us. And she died on August 6th. So, uh, since then, the family's been pitching in, um, going through the house, decluttering, removing things, parceling things out. And uh, it's amazing how much objects from the past are inconsistent with our recollection of them. <laughs> so my par my uh, sibs kept heaping things in a corner of, the, of mom's living room mom and dad's living room and uh, saying, okay, that's stuff you're supposed to take. And every time I came back to the house, it was like, it was getting bigger, you know? 
And so finally, I, I showed up with a couple of vehicles, and I heaped it all together and drove it home and dumped it in the dining room and, and thought, okay, I'll worry about that later. When my husband comes in, and he starts sorting through it, and he says, oh, here's your report card from eighth grade. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, eighth grade was awesome. I was an A student. I made straight A's. My parents were amazed. They couldn't believe how smart I was. And he says, you made a C minus in mathematics. <laughs> Who knew? Well, but I also, going through the basement, I came across something really awesome right out of the past. It was a happy memory, and I want to share it with you right now. I want you to know, so uh, this morning when I picked this up in, in the backyard, I had to clean out like all the dirt and the gravel from, that Francis had been piling into the back of it. So here's a little bit of the past who is carrying on. It still has his wheels. So uh, uh, they don't make them like they used to, man. So uh, with, with that thought in mind of the, of the past carrying into the future, I want to in, uh, invite our Brenda Quinn, our very own Brenda Quinn, member of the board, to come. She has selected a reading and is going to share that with us now. If you don't mind indulging me, I actually have a memory about this, too. I ran across this poem I'm about to read in freshman English class, and I was 18. And I read it, and I loved it. And I loved it so much that I memorized it, and I thought I understood it. I didn't. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> because it's more about, it's about the passage of time and looking back. So I love the fact that I get to read it to you guys now. All these, I'm not going to tell you how many years later from being an 18-year-old and memorizing it. By the way, I no longer have it memorized. The green catalpa tree has turned all white. The cherry blooms once more. In one whole year, I haven't learned a blessed thing they pay you for. The blossoms snow down in my hair. The trees and I will soon be bare. The trees have more than I to spare. The sleek, expensive girls I teach, younger and pinker every year, bloom gradually out of reach. The pear tree lets its petals drop like dandruff on a tabletop. The girls have grown so young by now, I have to nudge myself to stare. This year they smile and mind me how my teeth are falling with my hair. In 30 years, I may not get younger, shrewder, or out of debt. The 10th time just a year ago, I made myself a little list of all the things I'd ought to know and then told my parents, analysts, and everyone who's trusted me I'd be substantial presently. I haven't read one book about a book or memorized one pl plot or found a mind I did not doubt. I learned one date and then forgot. And one by one, the solid scholars get the degrees, the jobs, the dollars, and smile above their starchy collars. I taught my classes Whitehead's notions, one lovely girl, a song of Mahler's. Lacking a source book or promotions, I showed one child the colors of a luna moth and how to love. I taught myself to name my name, to bark back, loosen love and crying, to ease my woman, so she came, to ease an old man who was dying. I have not learned how often I can win, can love, but choose to die. I have not learned there is a lie. Love should be slimmer, blonder, younger, that my equivocating eye loves only by my body's hunger, that I have forces true to feel, 
or that the lovely world is real. While scholars speak authority and wear their ulcers on their sleeves, my eyes in spectacle shall see these trees procure and spend their leaves. There is a value underneath the gold and silver in my teeth. Though trees turn bare and girls turn wives, we shall afford our costly seasons. There is a gentleness survives that will outspeak and has its reasons. There is a loveliness exists, preserves us, not for specialists. Thank you, Brenda. So let's see. Uh, one more little point of housekeeping. All, I want to see, okay, yes. If you're new, if this is the first time you've ever come, will you please stand up? Oh, wow, amazing. Oh, my word. Oh, <laughs> blow my mind. Can someone help me count? One, two, three. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, it's amazing. 20. Super. Uh, and it's over here, we have coffee and tea. So after the service, I hope that everyone, newcomers uh, and old timers, please stay and uh, let's have a little time to uh, share coffee and some conversation. And then after that, after we've taken a little break doing that, uh, there will be uh, a chance to for more for conversation over at Sitar Restaurant for brunch, if you can make it there. So... Um, yeah, so Tom Weiler, we have an amazing speaker at this today. Uh, Dr. Weiler is um, a physicist, and um, I've, his CV is like 80 pages long, literally. <laughs> okay. His publications runs to 22 pages. 22 pages of publications. And um, so it was a little daunting uh, to come up with uh, some notions of just how you know, how to communicate the, this, the scope of Dr. Wider's reputation and uh, also the, the mind-blowing nature, the, uh, how interesting uh, the area of his study is. Uh, one thing that strikes me, though, about Dr. Um, uh, Wider's CV is, you know, he, he doesn't mention, uh, he, he does mention his PhD from Wisconsin, uh, and he does mention that he became uh, a professor in 1980. Eight and, and, and uh, or 84, 84, in at Vanderbilt. So in other words, before a lot of us in this room were born, or some of us anyway, and uh, and full professor there in 1995. But one thing that he doesn't mention is is his uh, kindergarten uh, program. But I'm willing to bet that he absolutely blew it out of the water, because <laughs> this man clearly knows how to play well with others. You know, there's uh, if, if the the extent of his projects of collaboration, um, pl of scientific collaboration, is really uh, extraordinary. And um, so Dr. Weiler is the go-to man in, uh, on co in cosmic waves. And if you have a billion-dollar project, for instance, that you want to put aboard a satellite, in, aboard a rocket, and try to convince the Japanese to let it occupy space in their you know, <laughs> multi-billion-dollar corner of the International Space uh, 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 you know, I, the ISS, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> we're talking big budgets here. And th if you need the right guy to head up the U.S. team to work with 130 other scientists to make this happen, Dr. Weiler has been the, the go-to man in that field. And, um, and that rocket, I understand, is set to launch in, from, on a, from, uh, by the Japanese in 2017. So uh, it looks like he pulled it off. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Weiler. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, and the uh, announcement of me exceeds me. It doesn't precede me, it exceeds me. <laughs> so, um, in, in the line of time and, and temporal time for human beings, uh, 
psychological time. I, I just read a book that I liked a lot, Larry McMurtry, whom you all know. Uh, have you read uh, Leaving Cheyenne? If, if not, I strongly recommend it. Three people, two guys and a gal, intertwined in a lifetime. The book is broken into three parts. Each of them uh, presents a part in the first person. And it goes from age 16 to, to older age. It's quite quite a nice book, I think. Okay, uh, but I'm here to talk about uh, time from the point of view of neutrinos and Einstein and Newton and lots of people, including me. So uh, let's begin. Uh, so physics is, I, I don't know if you can read this. Physics is summarized as a study of space, time, mass, and energy. Time is the least understood of these concepts. It surprises people to hear that. But um, in particle physics and in astrophysics, time is really poorly understood. We think that it can be reversed, that all fundamental processes that flow forward can be filmed, and if the films run backwards, we still get a physical process. We call that time reversal invariance. However, um, it's a broken symmetry. We, we know that from experiments. Some processes don't run backwards, but at a very, very small breaking rate. And yet when we get up to more is better, or, or, um, when we get up to psychological time, we think time runs only in one direction, only forward. Um, Einstein says that's not, not so, as we'll see. Uh, quickly, I think I have 15 minutes, and I'm going to try to stay to that time. So I'll put my watch here, and I'm about five minutes into it probably, so I want to end around a quarter of 11. And what else do I have on here? Uh, Oh, yes. So in 2011, there was an, an announcement, a forced announcement, forced because rumors had leaked out, an announcement by an Italian team of scientists that they had evidence that neutrinos traveling from Geneva, Switzerland to Gran Sasso, Italy, which is the area which has had the recent earthquakes, by the way, um, that those neutrinos traveled faster than the speed of light. And if that no scientists believed it, and they didn't believe it themselves, which is why they didn't want to announce this, but the leaks forced them to announce it. And it was really science at its best, because there was a challenge to other experiments. Go measure neutrino speed, see if it's traveling faster than the speed of light. Other experiments did the measurement, and no, neutrinos did not faster, travel faster than light. So first of all, what's a neutrino? We'll get to that. Secondly, the important thing is, what does it mean for a particle to travel faster than the speed of light? If a particle has mass, and neutrinos do, if a particle has mass, we can always, we say boost, we can always do a transformation to that rest frame. I mean, if, if a neutrino, if a particle has mass, we should be able to, through interaction, slow it down to stop it. And then in that frame, it's not traveling at all. So, um, Particles with mass are different than light, and Einstein taught us, as we'll see, that light is the ultimate speed barrier for any particle. So for a neutrino to travel faster than light, it has important ramifications, one of them being that if I intercept a neutrino traveling faster than light, say I'm on a rocket ship going very fast, that I can then send a neutrino back to the source, and it can get back to the source of that neutrino before the emitted neutrino left. So the whole issue of cause and effect goes out the window. We can have effects happening before causes. Now, um, this is a puzzle to Einstein, He's, and so he took the tack, as most of us have, that um, superluminal travel, that is, particles traveling faster than the speed of light, can't happen. Um, Stephen Hawking has even made a conjecture called the chronology conjecture that this cannot happen. That on a physical principle, that some quantum mechanical principle, some subtle physics will intervene to make this not happen. Well, and yet the Italian experiment said that it did happen uh, until they were debunked, and, and they debunked themselves eventually. They found one cable out of 10,000 that was leaking charge, and it uh, made them, gave them a false positive for, for time travel. Um, um, so they believed that for, for a while that po possibly particles travel fast in light and it made many people, including myself, reinvestigate this whole issue. What would it mean? 
So, um, I have some questions. Uh, are neutrinos this weird? Are they the only particles that would travel faster than light? Uh, we don't. We don't know. Uh, the result of their experiment is now de debunked. The answer seems to be no for their experiment. Uh, how poor, poorly or well do we understand time? The answer is not very well at all. Uh, is Einstein's theory incomplete? Maybe. Um, it's a. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's been. He's been dead since 1955. We, we heard about 1961. I was born in 1949. I guess I overlapped him with six years, but I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> but, uh, by the way, uh, mo most of those first six years I spent in the Black Hills of South Dakota wanting to be a cowboy. So uh, that, that obviously didn't work out. Uh, I'm glad the family moved from there. I probably would have been a homeless cowboy by now. Um, anyway, is Einstein's theory complete? Or is our speculations about space-time, are, are we just wrong? Is there more to be discovered? So the uh, neutrinos that were seen by this Italian experiment were made at the, what's called the Large, Large Hadron Collider, the biggest collider in the world. Um, what's a collider? It's an accelerator that accelerates particles in two directions and they collide head-on. We have no accelerators being built in the U.S. at, at the present time. Um, there is a lower energy uh, accelerator that will be built, presumably at Fermilab, to send neutrinos. That's this funky particle. To send neutrinos to, to the old Homestake underground mine in South Dakota. It's almost a mile underground uh, to measure neutrino properties. Nobody expects faster superluminal travel, but it will measure neutrino properties. But right now, uh, by far, this is the biggest accelerator in the world. This is where the so-called God particle, God with a little g, um, the, the Higgs particle was found, and, uh, and so far nothing else, which is a little problematic for the field, to be honest. If, if there's nothing else found, I think we're not going to see another uh, $2 billion machine in, in my lifetime. Maybe in yours, but not in my lifetime. So. This is a, above the detector in Gran Sasso, Italy. This is the area that had the earthquake. This is beautiful. And this is the, the trajectory, this is the path of these lowly neutrinos. Now, we're going to, I think it's the next, next slide when we get to it, is we're not ready quite yet, but when we get to it, we're going to discuss what is a neutrino. And um, it's the only particle that we know of that has no interactions except what's called the weak interaction, which is the interaction that happens in the sun. It, it allows the sun to, it allows fusion to happen in the center of the sun. Um, and in fact, the sun is a prolific source of neutrinos uh, through a cubic centimeter, uh, a, a square centimeter, which is the area of a fingernail. Per second, there's 100 billion neutrinos from the sun alone going through. This is what particle physics says, uh, and I believe it. And there's another 100 billion neutrinos left over from the Big Bang going through each square centimeter each second. So neutrinos are ubiquitous. Um, but they're so light in mass that they're the only second most prevalent particle in the universe. The most prevalent particle is, is light itself, the photon. Um, but anyway, uh, the neutrinos were made uh, through a process at CERN. They were, some of them were sent forward to this detector below Gran Sasso. It's a mountain that's been turned into an underground laboratory. And the, the inference was that these Okay, can you hear me in back? Okay. So the inference, uh, do I need to shout? Yeah, go ahead and speak up. I, the sound did go off, so, so if you could speak up. The sound went off. Um, thank you. Um, it's off. So these neutrinos, uh, uh, number-wise, they're, they're the second most uh, numbered particle compared only to light itself, the photon. And they traveled at... Uh, I think like 700 kilometers or so, and the inference was they were arriving too soon. They were arriving before the lights of the So, um, uh, so neutrinos, there's lots of them, square centimeters, blah, 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 fingernails. Uh, the electrons are a million times more massive, but neutrinos have a mass. So we can say. <laughs> Maybe there is a 
and, and she's made out of neutrinos. Um, so neutrinos do have a mass. We know that from experiments, too. So we can say that their mass is one millionth that of the electron, which is a very light particle in particle physics. Uh, and there's three types of neutrinos that are well known. It's known that there can only be three of the standard types with the weak interaction. Um, so if there's a fourth type, we'll get to that. It has to be, it, it can't even have a weak interaction. It will be uh, mainly gravitational. But we can know about it through mixing, and through mixing in extra dimensions, we can learn about time travel. It's interesting. Okay, next slide. So the neutrino postulated in 1933 by Wolfgang Pauli, uh, conserved en energy and momentum in neutron decay. You see, in 1933, it wasn't established with the rigor that it is today that energy and momentum are conserved quantities. That is, the energy and momentum that you see going into an interaction are the same as coming out. And so, um, so it was known that the neutron would decay to a positive charged proton and a negatively charged electron. But energy and momentum were conserved in that interaction. So he fixed it up by saying, OK, suppose there's an additional particle in the final state called, I'm going to call it a neutrino, the little neutral one. And uh, so he fixed it up. And that turned out to be true. So this particle was discovered in 1956 at the Savannah uh, River Reactor in South Carolina. And that was a year after Einstein's death. So I like to think of it that the Einstein era ended and the neutrino era, era began almost simultaneously. Um, in the 1990s and the 2000s, neutrinos as time portals to new physics were being investigated. That's what I'm here to talk about. And then, as I mentioned, 2011, this experiment is an acronym that was called OPERA. So these were called the phantoms at the OPERA particle. <laughs> Next. If it were true that neutrinos were slightly faster than the speed of light, as the Italians said, then the neutrinos from supernova 87A, which were, were measured, three experiments saw neutrinos from that supernova, that visible, eyeball visible supernova in 1987. And the time between the neutrino arrival and the, and the sighting, the visual sighting, the time it takes light to travel, was bounded. It wasn't bounded to be zero, but it was bounded. But had this uh, slight excess superluminal speed of the Italians been correct, then the news uh, would have the neutrinos from the supernova would have arrived four years earlier. So that was a, uh, a problem for them right off the bat. Next slide. So uh, here I'm going to fool with an equation a little bit. So C is the speed of light. That's the universal symbol for the speed of light. And speed is the change in distance, which mathematically we call delta x, over the change in time, which mathematically we call delta t. So for example, if your car is going 35 miles an hour, delta x means that you would go 35 miles divided by time, one hour, 60 minutes. So your speed would be 35 miles an hour. Same with light. Uh, it could have been infinite. We, it would have been a rather boring universe if the light were infinite. Everything would happen at the same time. But it's finite. We know that now. It's very fast, but it's finite. So I've taken uh, the first equation, defining the speed of light, put the speed on the right-hand side, squared it so that we don't have to talk about speed to the right or speed to the left. I don't have a sign in the square. And uh, the important thing is the relative minus sign between time and space, because Einstein taught us that time as a parameter is just as good as space as a parameter. That they're the same thing except for this minus sign. So just the space, I can write space as dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. You know, there's x, y, and z, forward, backward, left, right, up and down. I can add time, a little change in time. But I have to do it with that minus sign. And that minus sign makes all the difference in the world, in the universe, between Newtonian time and Einstein time. Because I have a subtraction here. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So if I go to the rest frame of a particle, all that dx stuff goes away. I'm, I'm traveling with the particle now. It's not changing its position from my point of view. So on the left-hand side, then, I have a, a time that doesn't know about change in position. I call that, it's the watch time, the clock time that this traveling particle would have or that I would have on my wrist were I traveling with the particle. 
So that, that's a definition. That can't change when I, when I change perspective, but the whole right-hand side can change. There's a subtraction there that allows change to happen. <coughs> so um, I mentioned that there are three kinds of neutrinos known, so a fourth kind would have to be different. Uh, that's an experimental constraint that we know. So the experiments would push fourth neutrinos and fifth and sixth into extra dimensions. Now, what are extra dimensions? Are they viable? Well, they are. Um, and we're taught that if we take particle physics and extend it to a theory called string theory, which you may have heard of, it got a lot of publicity in the uh, 80s and 90s, that consistency requires that we write the theory not in time plus three space dimensions, but in 10 or 11 dimensions. So that means there are extra dimensions, and it turns out experimentally they have to be space-like, not time-like. And um, so why do we not see them? Well, because they're rolled up. They're compactified, we say. We make them very small. And smaller than the human eye or the human body or any particle physics can discern. So each time a new accelerator is built, for example, the Large Hadron Collider at, at uh, Geneva, um, the energy available goes like one over the distance you can resolve. And so each time a higher energy accelerator is built, one of the first things is to look for extra dimensions. So far we haven't seen them. Puts a limit on them. The limit is tens of microns. It's a number. It's very small. It's, it's, I think a human hair is about is like 10 microns. So, so the limit on the size of extra dimensions is roughly the size of a human hair. It's not incredibly small by... If you're a human hair, it's not small at all. <laughs> yeah. If you're a people, maybe that's kind of small. Um, but what, what we've learned in physics is instrumentation <coughs> extends what we can see and the sizes we can see. We do astrophysics and we see large things. We can do interferometry and see things like gravitational waves, which is another story you may have heard. They were discovered recently. Uh, we can measure very small, subtle things. So. Here's a picture that's been developed of these strings that, that um, we live on three dimensions, three bulky space dimensions, and that the charge of strings lives on these dimensions. And so if, if there's charge involved, the string is stuck to our membrane. We say brain for short. It means membrane, the three-dimensional. It's three-dimensional. It's a volume in a bigger space. However, if there's no charge, if the string is closed, then it can propagate in all dimensions. That would be the graviton, for example. We think gravity pervades all dimensions. And so would these fourth, fifth, and sixth neutrinos pervade all dimensions because they would have no, they don't even have a weak charge. They have no electric charge, no color charge. They don't even have a weak charge. So they could per pervade extra dimensions. And if we do that, the cylinder here, this is an artist's conception of extra dimensions. Uh, but let's look on the left. So we live on the brain, which is the red line, the membrane. And the bulk is everything else. And active neutrinos have to, uh, I'm sorry, so the, the membrane is the wavy black line. Uh, we can't tell it's wavy because we can't do the experiment at short enough distances to see deviation. But the active neutrinos... Uh, are stuck to the membrane because they have a weak charge. But so-called sterile neutrinos, extra neutrinos, are not. They pervade all space. So they can travel faster than the speed of light. They can go straight through, we say, a geodesic path. They don't have to stick to the membrane. Suppose we live in a dimension, we live in three dimensions, which I'm going to compact. I'm going to pretend it's one or two, two. I'm going to pretend it's a sheet. And I bend it around. And I want to go from one pinky to the other pinky. So wouldn't it be shorter to just cut through, and that's what, that's what these closed string candidates can do. They can cut through. You could ask, but we would know that our space is curved this way. No, we wouldn't. If you work out the curvature from an embedded person on that, on that curved space, you can't see any curvature. It's planar. I can open it up without stretching or bending it. It's planar. Okay, next. So, <coughs> and I'm over time. I, I should stop, but uh, I, but this is a good one. Uh, this is <laughs> it's a technical one as well. 
Um, so here, here I have a space which I've reduced to one dimension, call it X, X and time. So the space axis runs left to right and the time axis runs up and down, north and south. And I want to divide this plane into four parts given by the speed of light. So light, uh, you can see going from the origin, you are here, to the upper right corner, light moving to the right. Um, light has to follow that diagon uh, diagonal because delta T, which is the vertical height, and delta X, which is the right height, remember their ratio is constant. So for each delta X, I get the same delta T. That means I get a diagonal, mo modulo speed of light. Speeds I can set to one by defining the speed of light to be one light year per year. So in those units, C is equal to one. That's a, it's a definition that I can always make. A light year is the distance light goes in a year, and if I divide that by a year, I think it's pretty clear I'm going to get one. So, so light moving to the right, light moving to the left, that cuts, cuts out the cone, which we call... Um, so we can, uh, so that's called the future light cone. And then um, also we have light coming to us from the past, and that makes the cone on the bottom, which is the lower light cone, the past light cone. Uh, but then there are these two red areas. Now those are those have to be hidden um, or forbidden if we're not going to violate causality. Those are the regions that Einstein and Hawking want to go away. And they're smart people. Right? One, one's dead, but he was smart, and one's alive, and he is smart. So maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe those red regions go away. But maybe they don't. And it's a physical question, so it really requires an experiment. And uh, uh, the Italians gave us their, their verdict, when, and then the, they overturned it. But um, if we can get into that forbidden zone, then um, this uh, transformation to and from rest frames is going to – can you see me uh, – can you see my finger here? So if I transform in the future light cone, I get a hyperbola. If I transform, if I, if I go to rest frames in the past, I get a hyperbola. Similarly, I get hyperbolas out here. But look, if I start on a hyperbola uh, with positive time, I can go to a rest frame, and then I can reverse the direction of that particle and go to negative time. So if I can just get past that light barrier, I can um, – I can also reverse cause and effect, and that's that's a positive if you want to reverse cause and effect, and it's a negative if you don't. Uh, it was a negative for Einstein and Hawking, and as I mentioned, they're bright people, but that could happen. Next slide. Okay, this is a technical issue. Next slide. <laughs> um, so one thing about Einstein's time. So so we have different times. And we have a time that sometimes is called the God time, with G, G, uh, God with a small g. So it's the time we use to coordinate everything. It's as if we're uh, outside of our space time looking at it and putting a coordinate grid of time on everything. If we go into that space time, if we're embedded like we are being human beings, time becomes very subjective. One can easily show that there's no definition of synchronicity. There's no same time when you have a uh, particle separated by a distance. There's no common time. It depends on the velocity of the person at the distance compared to your velocity now. So what we might call the past from our point of view might be the future from another point of view. And that leads to a very interesting issue. I don't have answers to these questions, unfortunately. Is the future as determined as the past? So we talk about remembering the past, but there's a word for remembering the future. It's called prememembering. Um, it hasn't been established that that exists, except as a word. And uh, we, we would like to know if it's wh why don't we prememember the future if the future is determined just like the past is determined? Why don't we prememember? Uh, one conjecture is it would blow our minds. We, we would go insane, and so we've evolved to not prememember. We've evolved to remember. I don't know. Uh, put another way, do we have free will? Well, that's an, uh, a related issue. Do we have, can we make choices or are they imposed on us? If the future is already determined, we don't have free will. We, we, we have what psychologists call the perception of free will, but we don't have free will if the future is determined. Um, are we just 
And so then the sort of conclusion of that is, are we just bags of chemicals? Are we, which uh, some people call moist robots? Is that who we are? Are we, mo <laughs> are we moist robots? Are we a kind of robots? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we, we think we're not, but maybe we are. Next slide. So uh, the history of physics is a history of better instrumentation, seeing smaller things, seeing bigger things, seeing without light, seeing neutrinos, seeing cosmic rays, which, which David referred to. Um, better technology to sense what humans cannot sense. And theoretical models speaking language of nature, which is mathematics, by the way. If, if, you, have a, if you have children or you are a child or you're a child at heart and you want to do uh, science, you got you got to stick it out. You got to learn the language of nature. You got to learn mathematics. Don't ever give up on math. Um, uh, these theoretical models—they're only interesting if they can be validated or invalidated by experiment. Now, that's that's my thinking. Others think otherwise, uh, but you get into philosophy once you can't validate or invalidate. So, um, a famous philosopher named Karl Popper said theories have to be validated or invalidated; otherwise, they're not. They're not worth investigating. I, I agree with that. So that's really my conclusion, and I'm out of time. So um, I've raised questions, and I, I'm telling you that they exist in physics. Uh, we don't have answers, and um, I don't know when, when we will, but it, it's all investigative stuff, mm -hmm. and it requires experiments. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Weider. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time, and thank you for, for coming to share that it's mind-blowing uh, 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 information about the scope uh, and complexity of the physical universe in which we live. It, it, it blows my mind to think that uh, the scientists have, have you know, has established that time itself is an aspect of the physical universe. It, uh, at um, Sunday Assembly, it's, uh, it's always been our practice, uh, it was established in London in 2013, to engage in a minute of silence or reflection. And um, I'd, uh, often what I reflect on is, well, why do we do that? You know, and and what, what does it mean? Why, why are we reflecting? Um, I've, I want to... You know, Dr. Weiler's uh, remarks today put me in mind of Carl Sagan's observation that we are the conscious corner of the universe, and as far as we know, the only conscious part of the physical universe. That we are we are chemical, ultimately uh, a chemical process, and yet we're one that has achieved self-consciousness, uh, and and um, and yet we are uh, we experience this consciousness in a way that's been determined by our evolution, we can't experience. We, we would, how would we cope with all the experience of our life, our 50 years or 60 years or 80 years, all in an instant all, or all at once? We can't. We, we're not evolved to that. We, we, by nature, we live in the moment. I, I've put in mind of, um, I think, a beautiful metaphor for this, uh, that I keep in mind, it comes from Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Slaughterhouse Five, where his hi hero, Billy, is thrown is in Dresden during a horrible, a calamitous event where there's terrible fire and death all around him. And he becomes unhinged uh, from the, uh, the calamitous nature of events. And he makes the observation that we're trapped, that we humans are, are, are trapped in amber, the, the amber of time and there is no why. And how much, you know, that strikes me as a very compelling metaphor, something that's really true. But for Vonnegut and for Billy, there was an upside to that. That is that we're only, we can experience time one moment, one, one instant at, at a time. And we rarely get an opportunity to do that in a community that is dedicated to celebrating life, to acknowledging that 
being in the conscious corner of the universe is a whole lot better than not. <laughs> and so here at Sunday Assembly, that's why we continue to have a moment of reflection. So um, it, it strikes me that it, there may be, I hope there are people here who practice mindfulness and are experts at that. I respect you if you do, and, and you may be among us. There may be others like me who have done some mindfulness practice. I'm certainly no expert at it, but I know that it informs, it's an important um, uh, discipline in order to really li be, uh, live happily. That if we cannot live just in the moment, that we humans cannot achieve happiness. That's my conviction. And so for the next minute, I'd like to, to join me and your community in just being in the moment.
Thank you, Pat. Thank you to the whole uh, band. Uh, awesome. Well done. It's beautiful. So it's uh, the time in our monthly service when we stop and reflect on, um, on decisions and decision making and ethical decisions and normativity. And, uh, but it's characteristic of Sunday Assembly that it doesn't come from a preacher and it doesn't come from uh, an authority figure. It comes from a member of the community. And so at this part of Try My Best, it, we invite different members of the community to come forward and to tell some anecdote, some story that uh, maybe reflects choices they've made or decisions they had to make and how they, you know, had, how they, how they reached their decisions and uh, maybe what the outcome was. And I want you all to welcome a very special member, a uh, wonderful ma uh, man who's been become a member of our community with his wife, Karen, and their, uh, their wonderful child a couple, few months ago, and that is David Ian Lee. David, will you come forward? <laughs> Try my best. Our theme is time. I often find myself looking toward the future, often a word intrinsically linked to the idea of time. I plan, I expect, I yearn, and I worry. I spend about as much time engaged with the past. Spend is another transactional word, and again, the currency is time. I ruminate, I regret, and I worry. I worry a lot. In the present moment, when I can find myself in a present moment, I do not worry. I can't worry. Worry is an activity reliant upon time as a linear progression. Worry cannot be performed independently in the present moment. Worry cannot live on now alone. So I'm, I'm relatively new to Nashville, but I've lived all over the country. And as of 2001, uh, New York became my home. I was a New Yorker before I ever lived in New York. Um, I grew up in California wanting to be an actor, and I always had my eye on that city. I grew up romanticizing the New York that I saw in movies and on television and on PBS broadcasting. And when I graduated college in 2001, I knew that New York would be my next step. Uh, before I'd left my program in Arizona, I had an agent, I had a sublet, I had jobs lined up. The one thing I did not have was a physical address. And that's good, because before I took the big plunge and bought my plane ticket and joined the city, I spent a year with the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. See, I work in theater, which is a profession with a unique relationship to time. Uh, theater folk are steeped in tradition and the history of our culture, but we work in an art form that is wholly about this present moment, and yet we are always hustling, always trying to line up our next job. We are always worrying. And so I found myself a New Yorker outside of New York in Milwaukee in 2001. And for that reason, my day 15 years ago is not unlike that of most Americans. I turned on the news, I saw the second plane, I turned off the news, and I went to my job. And when I walked through the doors of the Milwaukee Rep, I found the entire staff huddled around a small television with two rabbit ears. And the Pentagon had been hit, I was told. And I said, you know, I don't think I'm gonna be at rehearsal today. I walked back to my hotel, and during that time that I was walking, the two towers fell. And I spent my day calling friends and family, checking in, and it wasn't until the evening of September 12th that we had found everyone. I think about that day a lot, but I think as often about my September 10. See, in the theater, Mondays are your day off. Mondays are what we call our dark days. And in 2001, one of my dark days happened to land on Monday, September 10. And I treated myself. I walked from my hotel to a movie theater where the newest Kevin Smith movie was playing. Uh, in high school and in college, I, I, I loved Kevin Smith. This was a filmmaker who spoke to teenaged me. I felt that Kevin Smith uh, had a lot to say about my generation. 
But on September 10, on this Monday, I sat in the theater alone, and I wasn't laughing. I didn't find the jokes funny. I found the movie disappointing and juvenile and self-indulgent and narcissistic, and I realized it wasn't about anything. And on my walk back to the hotel on the night of September 10, I found myself thinking, I belong to a culture that is apathetic and disengaged. We're not about anything defined beyond ourselves, our petty wants and our scatological functions. <laughs> 90s malaise and disengagement, the fight club years, have leaned into 2001, and I thought to myself, we need that galvanizing event that can unite us as a people for the common good. We need the thing that can make us better. Kennedy said we go to the moon. My grandfather fought the Nazis. My great-great-parents, grandparents, came to California. They pushed west until there was no further they could go. But what do we have? And the next morning, I sat in my hotel room and I watched the news. So a month ago, when I offered to speak this morning, knowing we'd be meeting on the 15th anniversary of September 11, I thought I would have a lot to say about the passage of time. And yet I've struggled. I thought I would have something to say about regret. I've been dismayed at what I view as the squandering of our galvanizing moment. We used to go to the moon and now we're afraid of heights. We don't live up to the greatest generation. Instead, we sank into fear and into worry. I thought I would find something to say about looking forward, about what's to come, about maybe how we, or at least I, have bettered since that day. But any betterment, I have to admit, is largely due to the influence of my wife and my son, both of whom came into my life in New York City. And I still worry. I worry now about braces and about field trips, about college tuition, about the children that my child may have, their children after that. Time refers also to the now. And I do believe that if we can take this present moment to acknowledge this present day and acknowledge the singular event that impacted our lives in ways unimaginable and innumerable, the way in which the course of time was bent one morning, then we can be a little bit better than the culture that I feared on September 10. Thank you. Thank you, David, Ian. That was, uh, I really appreciate that. That was powerful. Um, so this is uh, everyone's favorite moment in uh, Sunday Assembly service, where we ask you for some money. Please give us some money. <laughs> and let me preface it by saying, you know, we're trying to use this money uh, effectively and, um, and uh, responsibly. But uh, it does cost money to put on Sunday Assembly events. We have... Uh, of course, this monthly service, uh, it's, as you see, it, it's quite a production, uh, and there is, there is cost associated with that. The, just the space itself, we, we get uh, this room and another big room for the kids, um, uh, runs into, I think we're paying just north of $400 a month now. Uh, so think of $400 for us to be here together to uh, share these thoughts, this information, have an occasion to be with uh, Tom Weiler, to hear from David Ian. So, um, and likewise, there, there are other costs. It, uh, so in one week, uh, there will be uh, a coffee and Danish in the park. That wasn't free, that cost some money. Uh, the, the band from time to time needs more equipment. It's, believe me, that's not free stuff. And so for that reason, that is why we're asking you for money. So I hope, now, I wanna recognize uh, our uh, treasurer, T Tanya Trisais, Tanya, will you stand? Thank you. Tanya has been our treasurer for three years. She is a very reliable and responsible woman, and she also is, in, and she's very good with, with money and keeps good care of it and makes accurate reports frequently to the board about uh, your money and, and how it's being used and where it is. And uh, she also is able to receive uh, pay, uh, donations by credit card. 
and she can do that using her the cell phone that she has through Swipe. So I'm going to during this time I'm going to ask you to look for Tanya over here if you will make uh, if you want to make a one-time donation or set up a recurring donation by credit card or debit card. And I have Pat. Do you have extra hats in the bag? Yes, you're a production chair, and I've relied you on you, you so much for bringing hats. But <laughs> but Scarrett Bennett has provided us with this bin today. So, um, are you cool with the truck? All right, it's heavy. It's heavy. I don't think that is. Yeah. So you can either put it in the rolling Tonga truck or in the black bin which is somewhat less um, <coughs> sentimental. <laughs> ah, yes, it, that's good too. Uh, Brenda has found us some more bins. Thank you, Brenda. So, and, and while we're doing this, I'd, uh, uh, we have a number of announcements of other exciting things that Sunday Assembly is doing, uh, more opportunity to build community together. And I want to recognize uh, board member Patrick Horst, who is here to <coughs> make these announcements. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, really briefly, uh, as David mentioned, this this morning is only a small part of what Sunday Assembly is. There's stuff going on all throughout the month, and I'll just uh, highlight a few things uh, for your information. Um, as I do so, I'll ask uh, certain people to stand or wave so uh, you can know who to talk with. Um, number one, there is a uh, community service project going on this month, as is in the program. If you would like to help the doggies and the kitties who don't have any home, well, then there's a... Uh, you know, way for you to help them out. And uh, is Peg here this morning? Anyways, if she is, or there's there's a box out front, um, and you can contact her as far as donating things for that um, donation for that um, service project through the Nashville Humane Association. Also, if you are interested in becoming involved with what is Sunday Assembly Nashville, the annual meeting is coming up October second, and information in, in your uh, printout here. If you want to take the time to unpack or just really understand something better that happened there, all the videos of all the assemblies are online on our YouTube channel. Jason does an awesome job with that. And um, if you could do us a favor, actually, we are about halfway there to getting 100 likes on our Sunday Assembly YouTube channel. So if you would do that, then we can customize a name. And uh, you know we have like 700 likes for Facebook, but only 40 for YouTube, so we kind of want to boost YouTube if you would help us with that. Um, if you are kind of into the whole mindfulness thing that you uh, heard talked about this morning and like to get involved, Pat Sharp, um, if you would uh, wave here. Um, she is starting a mindfulness group, and um, she's the person to ask about getting involved with that. Also, um, really quickly, if I could ask uh, Gail Jordan to stand, please. Everybody, this is Gail Jordan. She is running for state senate in the state of Tennessee. Yep, thank you, Gail. If you would like to find out about how you could support um, that campaign, there's an event October 15th that you can get involved with, and uh, again, information here on your printout. Uh, also, very quickly, if you happened to fill out one of these feedback forms, um, if you would like to drop it off by the door, there's some collection boxes right there. Um, did I miss anything? I know there's a couple of things here. So last month we had uh, our maker, uh, Theme. And my partner and friend, Matt Kennickson, is here from Inc. Nashville. He has an exciting opportunity about the Mini Maker Fair. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey, good to see you. And I'll hold these. Oh, thank you. Well, I just need one. I'm good. You talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are uh, less than a week away from Nashville Mini Maker Fair, the fourth annual. Woohoo! Everybody, woohoo! All right. We will have Power Wheels racing, drone races, robot combat, all kinds of stuff, over 70 makers. It's going to be very exciting and very fun, and we need everybody in Nashville to know about it. So I need your help. Yeah. So I have 100 of these posters, and I have a deal for you. <laughs> if you put up three of these posters in a shop window and take a picture of it and send it to me, I will give you a free ticket to the fair. If you put a five, I'll give you two tickets to the fair. So um, 
I will be up here with some posters. Uh, I just ask that if you commit to doing this, please, please, please actually do it because we only have a hundred of these posters and they need to be all over town and they need to be in the bestest, hippest, most wonderfulest places in town. And I know you guys know where all of those places are. <laughs> so uh, I'll be back here. Come visit me and I have posters for you. Thank you. We also have a meetup on the Maker Fair. So do you have any other words to say, David? Uh, in announcements, yes. So yeah, I'll follow okay. up. And I was told to tell you that there will be a BB-8. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'd like to uh, ask David Ian to come back to tell us uh, some, uh, about an exciting production he's involved with. Hello, me again. Uh, very briefly, uh, my wife and I are producing a short run of a play and Nelson's The Guys. We have two more performances tonight and tomorrow evening, both shows at 7.30 at the Belmont Little Theater, which is impossible to find. So if you will find me after, uh, we can give you a directions or you can visit our website, which I'll say and I'll say again in a moment here, uh, pipeline-collective.com. All seats are pay what you can, whatever you can and proceeds benefit the Feel Good Foundation for First Responders. Uh, it's a project, everyone involved in the show is from New York here in Nashville, and it was something we wanted to do to commemorate the 15th anniversary of the day. That's pipeline-collective.com, or you can see me. Thank you. Thank you. Does, is that it? it? Any, any other announcements? Anyone I've overlooked? The gentleman here. Is this Okay, thank you, thank you. Sunday the 25th for Beer and Books. Super. And lunch at 6 o'clock. Lunch, yes. Uh, uh, to recap, lunch uh, will be after our coffee half hour, <laughs> and uh, that's at CTAR, which is over on West End Avenue. And there's a gentleman here. Will you tell me your name, sir? I haven't uh, Shannon White. Hey, Shannon, thank hey. you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Georgia. Georgia <laughs> McRue. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. <coughs> so as I was reflecting earlier, uh, this has been quite a year for my extended family with uh, the death of my, my, my parents, who had been, they had been married for 61 years this year, uh, 62 in July, would have been their 62nd. And um, so there's a lot of time and uh, history, uh, at least from the human perspective, from my very limited perspective, that's been compacted, you know, in th that relationship and uh, the birth of um, my three older siblings and then me and uh, what there, there, uh, there are ten grandchildren and fifteen great grandchildren, and we I've been thinking a lot about that passage of time and, and, and reflecting on you know what is that about? You know, it, it's a pretty southern family, uh, not to say you know very southern Gothic, uh, but um, uh, uh, but there is some of that going on, and uh, you know with. Um, family had, uh, uh, my parents grew up in a, in a small town in Arkansas, Mena, Arkansas, and met there when they were very young. Mother graduated high school when she was 16 and um, knew her new dad uh, in her senior year, and they married four years later. So, um, uh, you know, it was very, uh, uh, it was, I guess that was a very Arkansas story in, in some way, uh, and uh, 
her family especially had, was, had always been in the, in, in the South. They had, uh, at, one, at one point, the generations had come through Nashville. I have ancestors who, when we moved here in the 70s, we rediscovered or re, you know, reconnected with the fact, oh, yeah, yeah, that uh, my direct ancestors, the Dillahunties, had arrived here in the 1780s. Um, and so one of them was a preacher, a Baptist preacher, and set up uh, Mill Creek Baptist Church. And, um, and is buried over here in the Richland uh, Golf Club, apparently. And so, I mean, so it, it, was, it was kind of weird to, kind of, to be here and to realize that, oh, that, um, that um, I'm already, con already connected to this place in some way. And what does that mean? Um, and uh, what's all that about? So um, the family, as I say, is we've really been unpacking uh, mom and dad's house and trying to remove things and declutter. We have a, uh, a realtor uh, has come in who's helping us to prepare to market this house. And it's all about declutter, declutter. So it's, in other words, what all of us should be doing every day in our own homes and uh, <laughs> trying to get rid of things. And uh, so I've been going through um, uh, um, you know, little photos of, of all of us from, uh, uh, from our childhood. My, my, my uh, six-year-old came across a, a little 1970s uh, uh, Kodak shot. And she looked at it and she said, Daddy, did you make that snowman? And it's, Sure enough, it was me standing with the snowman. But what I saw was, wow, 15, and I had hair, and I had a 29-inch waist, you know. <laughs> Just, so I was looking at it you know, from a different point of view. What, what, what interested me was you know, way different. And, uh, uh, and then I, we'd been uh, going through layers of boxes of things that were stored in the basement. And I thought we had, had nearly finished everything. Then I knew that everything that was in that house. Uh, and the other day, I came down steps um, to the, the, into the basement. And at the, on the floor, amidst some other scattered debris, was this box, a big box. Big box. You know. yeah. um, and on it, it said, it had an address. It said, Miss Mary Frances Hodges. 7th Street, Mena, Arkansas. So I thought, oh, what is this box? I've never, I've, you know, I grew up in more or less um, among the same clutter. It was not the same house I grew up in, but I thought I knew everything in, in this place and, and, and its meaning and what it meant to me. And I opened the box, and in the box is this poop scrunchie. And I think, oh, my word. My mother. Mother must have gotten, she graduated from high school at 16. She, she must have gotten this, you know, like she was 15 years old. Here's this hoop skirt from 1951. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, Southern nationalism, and what is that all about anyway? And, you know, and, and what did that mean to her? Because I mean, it, it certainly, you know, uh, it's interesting because she certainly didn't hold on to that hoop skirt out of any sense of uh, Southern, you know, nationalist pride. But, uh, but I thought, well, what would it have meant to a 15-year-old? And, and now she's gone. I can't ask her. You know, that, that thought. We all have those, those thoughts when, about those we, we've loved that, you know, we think, oh, I'll ask them next week when I'm with them. Oh, that's right. I can't do that now. So I thought, well, I, I may never know the full story behind this, this hoop skirt. But I also thought of my, my daughter, Mary, six years old, and there was a long time when she was three and four, when she said when she grew up, she wanted to be a hoop skirt. She <laughs> actually, specifically, she wanted to be a, um, an umbrella, because that was, that was her way of saying a hoop skirt. She wanted to be a princess in, in a hoop skirt. And uh, so I thought, okay, I don't know wh why this box is still, you know, mother must have it clearly connected to her past in some way. She did save it all these years, even though she had dedicated her life to uh, progressive politics and to making um, a place for women in the broader world uh, in throughout Tennessee. And yet <laughs> she held on to this hoop skirt that from 1951 that re reflected uh, previous generations 
a, a culture that you know, um, I, I thought we were leaving behind. And but it, it speaks. I know it, it connects in some way to my daughter Mary. And so I picked up this box and I put it in the trunk of the car and took it home for the daughter, for Mary and Francis to to uh, to play with. Actually. Long story short, they were actually were there and, and reminded that I had told them, made the mistake of saying that, girls, I found this hoop skirt in Mamaw's basement. And they were like, wow, when do, when do we get it, Papa? Daddy, we want it now, we want it now. And uh, when we were leaving the house on this occasion, uh, they said, Daddy, have you gotten that hoop skirt yet? And I said, oh, listen, girls, just give me time, let me get it. And, and carry it out to the car and take it home. You can wreck it and ruin it just as fast there as you can here. <laughs> you know, you, six year olds being what they are, I'm not sure how long this, this uh, hoop is going to last. But it, it strikes me that that box was like this little time capsule. The whole house, every, and so many of the objects in our lives, and in anime, the photographs we have, are little time capsules. But they don't have any specific meaning. Meaning. It's it, we are the ones who bring meaning to them. I'm reminded of um, of, of uh, a line from, speaking of Southern Gothic, of um, a Tennessee Williams play, Glass Menagerie. Uh, a character makes the observation that time is the shortest distance between any two places, or, or rather, time is the longest distance between any two places, the longest distance. And I've never fully understood what Williams or the character really meant about that until I began dealing with these objects and realizing that the truck or um, you know, that box really what m counted to me was that it had my mother's maiden name on it, addressed to her home, you know, my grandparents' home. What is significant to my daughter Mary and Francis is that it's a dress-up toy they can play with. And it connects uh, um, my family still to 7th Street in Mena, Arkansas, and that my daughters now are that longest distance between Mena and Nashville, or and between that, that past and this present. And with that thought, I would like to ask the band to come forward. They have a couple of closing numbers for us. I'd like to thank our host today, David Lyle. Thank you very much, David. We also have a number of people that make these assemblies work. And I would like to acknowledge Jeremy over here. You don't see much of him, but you see his work. He helps us with the visuals. Thank you, Jeremy. He is always, so, he's someone you can always count on. And our wonderful sound is because we have a sound team led by Jason in the back. <laughs> Jason can always make us sound great. Our unnamed assembly band version 2.0, Girl Power, Woo! we have <laughs> Sebi to my left. Dylan, who pulled it all together on keys, <laughs> Heather to my right, and Jen to my right. And we also have a couple of honorary girls. We have Stephen Phelps, who has hair almost as nice as mine. And we've got Chris Shannon, who keeps us in time. <laughs> so as we finish, we want to remind you to uh, take time to celebrate afterwards and join us for lunch. And also... Last but not least, I also want to acknowledge Adam because back there you don't see much of him, but Adam is the magic. He really, he really helped us come together. If you thought we were tight today, it's because Adam was, he's, I, I don't know, he's beyond girl power. <laughs>
I hope you had a 